God bless America. Hello, everybody. I am the talk radio protege. This is the protege program. Thank you so much for joining me. It's back to another week of the news. I hope that you're excited, as excited for it as I am. I have two stories that I want to talk to you about today. The first, so the president tweeted an all caps message to Iran late last night. And my first thought when I read the tweet was finally somebody is saying something to Iran. Somebody is doing something about Iran. Now, I had to kind of catch myself there because some doing something is not not exactly what a tweet is. You know, I, I talked last week about the president was saying one thing about Russia and was doing something totally different. The president was cozying up to Vladimir Putin, to put it in the way that the media has been putting it, while while taking vicious action against the country of Russia. So, it's not action, I must correct myself, it's not action to, to say something to Iran, it's action to do something to Iran. So, what has Iran been doing that, that I would like to see something done to them for? Well, Iran has the year, I think, I'm pretty sure it's a yearly celebration where people in Iran flood the streets to burn American flags and chant death to America. And in the midst of Iran doing all of that, you had the nuclear agreement that was being talked about. You had $150 billion in cash that was shipped to Iran on in the dead of night in a cargo plane that was unmarked. That's what was going on during a certain president's administration, the previous president's administration to be precise. And a lot of people were very upset about that. Understandably upset. You know, why are we cutting deals where we're giving things away to a country whose culture includes a yearly celebration where people flood the streets and chant death to America? Why would we support that kind of country? Well, the Trump administration campaigned on being much tougher on Iran, campaigned on getting out of the Iran nuclear deal, campaigned on not being soft on our geopolitical rivals and enemies. And so far, I think he's carried that out. I think the, the country that Trump has been softest on is North Korea. But from what I have heard, there have been no new sanctions against North Korea. All there has really been was that war of words that happened that had everybody in the liberal media thinking that we were going to all die in a nuclear holocaust that then turned out to not actually happen and what resulted from the continuing of tough sanctions and the new policy of being vicious with words led to North Korea approaching the negotiating table. North Korea finally becoming willing to approach the, the negotiating table. Which, I think most sane people would agree, is a good thing. It's better when a, uh, when a lunatic regime decides, you know, let's talk instead of do terrible things. Let, let's talk about maybe fixing some of our problems. That's better than the continuing of bad things happening to the citizens of those countries. So, what ha let, let's, let's back up a couple of steps. What happened that prompted this tweet from President Trump? Well, the Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, had set, had made a statement. He had remarked earlier in the day that America must understand well that peace with Iran is the mother of all peace and war with Iran is the mother of all wars. Now, you probably got to see the tweet from Trump earlier on in this piece because it comes before this statement right here. But before you get before we get to that tweet, stop and think about what these what these words might insinuate now th this is kind of a um th this is 
kind of I'm, I'm trying to come up with an analogy here off the top of my head uh, but the the uh, the Ayatollah the pre the Iranian president said that peace with Iran is better than peace with any other nation and war with Iran is worse than war with any other nation and that that's to put in plain English uh, getting rid of the youth cutting through the euphemisms what the what the president, what the Iranian president said. So, uh, analogy. What would this be an analogy for? Um, the closest thing that I can think of is be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. See, the, the Iranian president is, is threatening that war with Iran is going to be very, very bad for America. Now, all you have to do is look at the way that we've handled previous wars in the Arab world to see that there might be a kernel of truth to that. Now, we, we went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan in the early 2000s. It's been 15 plus years and there is still violence going on over there. There, there's there's still conflict. There's still American troops deployed overseas in those in those war zones. It's been a bad time. Now there are various reasons for that, but it hasn't been a good. But it hasn't been good. So maybe Iran is just saying, you know, look, you've went to war with these other Islamic and Arab nations. What do you think it's going to be like if you were to go to war with? Iran with another Arab nation and this has been th this uh, sort of escalation in the in the trouble between Iran and the US was prompted by the president of uh, Trump pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal this, the deal of course that prompt that, that virtually guaranteed that Iran was going to get nuclear weapons so let, let's now read the tweet that Trump sent in response to that statement from the Iranian president. Never, all caps, you know that Trump is, <laughs> you know Trump is serious when he's tweeting in all caps. Never ever threaten the United States again or you will suffer consequences the likes, the like of which few throughout history have ever suffered before. Now, I want you to, for a moment, just so that you can understand how excited I was to read that that tweet. Imagine, can, can you imagine President Obama thinking something like this, much less putting it into a public forum? Can you imagine never ever threaten the United States again? I can't, I can't do an Obama impression, but anyway, it, it wouldn't happen. Obama would never say anything this tough about anyone, ever. You know, we, we heard that Obama had told Putin to knock it off on the met on the election meddling before November 2016, but we didn't get to hear the actual words. We didn't get to hear if Putin had responded. All that we knew was uh, was from Obama that he had told Putin to knock it off. That's the toughest that Obama ever got with anybody that was not from the United States of America. He had plenty of harsh words for Republicans and American citizens. But he had very few harsh words for foreign nationals. Trump, on the other hand, has been very tough, very vicious with his foreign policy rhetoric. With, with one exception, of course. With, with a couple of exceptions, of course. With the exception of whenever he has a meeting with someone, he wants to say nice things about that person. That seems to be his M.O when it comes to having meetings with international heads of state. He wants to be able to say nice things about them. So, this kind of response to overt threats of violence from Iran is something that Republican and conservative rank-and-file voters have been longing for for many years, ever since, you know, I guess really ever since George Bush got cowed by the fact that he had a 14% approval rating or whatever absurdly no low number it was, we've been longing for someone to be tough in their foreign policy, rhetorically and policy-wise. 
and President Trump is finally doing a lot of that. A lot of that. I would I would say about 80%. I'd say he's doing pretty good. He could do better. Of course, anybody can do better in whatever area of their life. Of course, in the eyes of the left-wing media, the president can never win. President Trump can never be allowed to do anything right. But, in spite of all of that coverage from the left-wing media, the president has been able to persist in the policies and the rhetoric that he ran on in the presidential election. Let's go now to the next story that I want to that I wanted to talk about today. And the headline is from here from Fox News. Trump looking into revoking security clearances for Brennan, other top Obama officials. Now, I my eyebrows went up into my hairline when I learned this. And may, I'll tell you what I learned that did that, and you might understand why. Apparently, there's a long list of people, whose name, some of whose, some of whose names are mentioned here. Former FBI Director James Comey, former Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe, former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, former National Security Advisor Susan Rice, and former CIA Director Michael Hayden. Now, I said one word over and over and over again reading that paragraph, and that is the word former. Now, that now learning that these individuals have still have security clearance caused my eyebrows to shoot up into my hairline. And the reason is because these are all former government officials. What business does James Comey have that he that need, means he needs security clearance? James Comey, to my knowledge, no longer works for the federal government. Andrew McCabe, to my knowledge, no longer works for the federal government. What do these people still have security clearance for? Now, I don't know why somebody would continue to need a high level of security clearance after they've left government work. It seems to me like that would be a security threat for these people to retain their security clearance. These are civilians for all intents and purposes. These are not government officials anymore. Why do they have security clearance? It seems to me like it would be proper for these people to lose their security clearance on hour zero when they leave, right before they leave federal employment, right before they get fired, right before they get retired, the last thing that they do before they turn in their badge and their gun or whatever paraphernalia they have that the government has given to them, the last thing that they should do before they leave their position is have their security clearance revoked. And the why seems obvious to me. You no longer work for the FBI. You don't need your security clearance anymore. You don't need to be able to go snooping around in law enforcement agencies' databases. You're not a law enforcement agent anymore. You don't need that information. If my understanding is correct, the federal government takes extreme... Well, maybe extreme is the wrong word. Take a lot of measures. There's a lot of training, and there are a lot of steps that the federal government goes through to protect data, and to protect information from being shared improperly. So I, I cannot fathom why an ex-employee of the federal government would get to keep his security clearance, or her security clearance, in the case of Susan Rice. It seems to me like that would be a tremendous threat to national security. So I, th I, I agree with Rand Paul. I think that the president should make, sh should make no delays in revoking the security clearance of all former federal employees. Because they don't need it anymore. They're not federal employees. Why do you have security clearance if you're not working? Why do you have security clearance 
for a branch of the federal government for which you no longer work. I, 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 I can't compute. I can't compute that. I refuse to believe that this is the reality in which we are living. That's going to do it for this video. I hope that you all enjoyed. Leave a like if you did. Hit subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so that you don't miss future uploads. A very exciting week of news is lays before us, I'm sure of it, but an even more exciting week of videos is coming next week, and I don't think that you're going to want to miss out on those. As the time of next week draws nearer and nearer, I realize, <laughs> I realize just how poor time management skills I actually have. So there are two videos that are coming next week. They are done recording. They are ready to go. They will be coming out next week. I promise you that. A third one I don't think requires much more work before I record and upload it. The fourth one is the Roe vs. Wade video. And it's going to be extremely long. So I'm thinking do that guy in two parts do a, do, and, and they're going to be two really long parts, so do those two parts, and then in a sixth video, a special Saturday edition, fingers crossed this is what happens, in a special Saturday edition, there'll be a, um, there'll be an analysis video on Roe vs. Wade, a kind of too long didn't watch, uh, impact of Roe vs. Wade video. So I hope that you will subscribe and be looking forward to those videos. Thanks again so much for watching this video. Until next time, good night and God bless.